Hi, Miranda. Um, you talked about the ferocity of the response you had to your column and probably other columns you've written before. In terms of the correct response for those that might support you or, or that share those beliefs uh, against what you call that soft left type of liberalism, you talk about the ferocity, the emotion behind it. Should we respond in kind? Some people would say, look, we need to have a nice, rational, measured response to that. And others would say, that doesn't work. We need to respond with that same ferocity and that same emotion. Is there a place for that latter? Or should we be trying for the former, always calm, almost defensive in our response? Look, the latter, I, I'm always calm and um, I don't think you have to be defensive though. I just don't think you have to be um, nuts. And, and you know, you see it with, in politics. The, the people who, um, you know, for instance, when they have these convoys of no confidence and so on, um, and it's fantastic that people are feeling that they can, you know, get out there and, and make a difference by protesting. But, um, you know, you can see that it gets spoiled because there are a few people who get over emotional. And I think it's because they feel, just as you're saying, that the other side it just gets away with blue murder and so on. And I know that when I write my columns, I am a thousand times more careful than my colleagues on the left because my columns are going to be cherry picked and forensically examined and pulled apart on Twitter and, you know, on Media Watch and everywhere else. Um, and people are going to pull out quotes and things out of context. And so I sort of bulletproof my arguments and bulletproof my columns. And I think that kind of um, clarity and um, real, I guess you've got to be a bit cynical and, and very careful. You're almost like a soldier going into battle. You really are. You have to put on all the armour and you have to make sure that every single bullet is in place and is perfect because you cannot afford to make a mistake. And being intemperate is a mistake, really. Um, look, other people may disagree and think that being, being passionate and emotional is a better thing, but I think you're, you're Australians particularly are turned off by um, what they call extremism, and that's extreme passions. And again, it comes back to that reticence. So, I think that you will make people listen to you if you are calm and quiet and choose your words very carefully and don't say too much. Um, and, you know, the written word is a great vehicle for that. And I, I, But I do think you have to be vigilant and you cannot let things go. So every time someone makes some, especially this, this very dishonest way of debating has grown up, and then I think I blame uh, social media. Um, and particularly Twitter, but it's this way of just pulling out a, um, a, a quote out of context and twisting it, putting it, putting a completely dishonest, the, almost the opposite meaning on it, and then just saying that that's what happened. And um, it's a, it's a, it, you know, it's a form of rhetoric that's been around for a long time, but it seems to be exaggerated. Um, with social media and therefore the whole debate becomes really surreal because you end up people, you know, like this thing about I said can anyone cause the riot? Some people believed it because they read it on Twitter and um, it was just ridiculous. So you end up defending yourself against something that you never said that you wasn't even... And then when you defend yourself people say, aha, she must have said it. So it's difficult but I think you just have to have the, um, the heart of a lion and um, the brain of a, a forensic lawyer. Just to the back here. Hi Miranda, thanks for your, your talk and your, your great work. Um, you spoke earlier about your writing to um, prompt the prayers of, of strangers for people in certain circumstances. How does prayer sort of fit into your life and your work? Well, um, this, this is a sort of funny little secret, but I and it's not probably very edifying, but I pray whenever I, you know, if I'm doing a column and it's not coming out well or I'm pushing up against it, I'll pray then. Uh, I prayed before I came in here, you know, and I prayed when I saw how many people there were here. <laughs> um, 
So I guess, I mean, I've just, since I was a child, I just pray, you know, all the time at the drop panel, say thank you, and, you know, good things happen. Um, so, and then uh, I've always, um, you know, said prayers with my two boys before they go to bed, and um, they have adopted that. Um, now, you know, I, I walked into my, I probably shouldn't tell you because it'll embarrass me, but anyway, I, I walked into one of my son's rooms. One morning I was getting cross with him because he wasn't getting out of bed and coming, you know, coming downstairs to get ready for school. And, um, and I, was, I was really fed up with him and he came down and then he quietly said to me, Mommy, I'm praying. So, so that's nice. Um, so I, I, it just is part of my everyday life and then of course, you know, going to Mass on Sundays and I, you know, I'm not, I'm not as diligent as I probably could be, but um, it's just there, part of the sort of fabric of my life. Uh, again, just at the back, right?